And as I like to say, this is a media member Sunday. And uh, we're so glad to have each and every single one of you joining us wherever you may be and however you may be watching. Guys, are y'all ready to sing? Yes, sir. You need some help, Randy? You got it? I'll help you. Here's a couple of curls. <laughs> He's a way maker this morning. Oh, 
Come on, just sing that chorus one more time. Yes, a Jesus. Yes, a way maker, Jesus. Yes, a way maker, Jesus. Yes, a way maker. One day he made a way for me. Yes, when I was lost and undone, God sent his only son. And one day he made a way for me. I want to just encourage everyone that is watching, don't forget, as Dad mentioned, to pay your tithes. You can go online, sunlifetv.com, or you can call the number on the screen, and we would greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it. Thank you, singers, and thank you, musicians. I'm going to come to you this morning from the Old Testament book of Exodus. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and switch my mics right now. The book of Exodus the 14th chapter, beginning and just reading two verses here this morning. Exodus 14, beginning in verse 13. Many of you know the situation, the story of which we're going to be ministering on today. But for those of you that don't, I believe that there are some very important aspects to what is going to be said here that I believe are applicable to all of us here Today, Exodus 14, beginning in verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And I want to use for a subject ministering just for a few moments here today. Fear not, stand still, for God will fight for you. Fear not, stand still, God will fight for you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for your presence. Lord, we thank you for your spirit. We ask for your help today to minister your word. We ask for your anointing. We ask for your leading, and we ask for your guidance. Minister to your people in this time of uncertainty, and we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. There was quite a celebration The children of Israel were experiencing something that they had not experienced in generations. For those generations, many of them, all they had known was slavery in Egypt. But here they are, the the people of God, God's children. They are in an excitement. Something they had never experienced before. For now, 
for the first time that many of them have now experienced freedom and deliverance from bondage. I want us to think about this for a moment. I said it just a second ago, and I want to just repeat it. For generations, all God's people knew they were born, raised in slavery. They had not experienced freedom. Backbreaking work, building the treasure houses of Egypt. All they had known was this slavery under bondage to a demonic madman whose title was Pharaoh. Their cries would begin to pierce the heavens, asking God for a way out, asking God for deliverance, asking God for something to take this thing away. And God's ear would be turned down to his people. And he would in turn raise up a man by the name of Moses who would stand before Pharaoh and demand, let my people go. Maybe he had thought that in his mind that Pharaoh would relent after once or twice, but six times Moses stands before Pharaoh. And in every situation, the bondage grows more difficult, more fierce, more dominant. Nine plagues would rain down from heaven, completely destroy the nation of Egypt. But even though these nine plagues were some of the most powerful demonstrations of God the world had ever seen, the people of God were still in bondage. But there was one last plague, the most devastating of all. As God would speak to Moses and say that there is an angel of death that is coming through the city. And the only means of safety is through the shed blood of the Lamb. The only means of safety from that angel of death would be the blood on the doorpost of every home. For the scripture says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. It's the same presently right now. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. There's the old song, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. I want you to think about that. They were instructed. Every child of God was instructed to take a lamb, slit its throat, allow that blood to be caught into a basin and take hyssop and place the blood on the door mantles of each home. And when that death angel would sweep over that nation, every home that had the blood, their home would be spared. And all of a sudden, the calm and quiet night was broken. The heartbreaking cries of a mother. The devastating cries of a father. As they would see the firstborn son, man and cattle, whose home was not protected by the blood, as that angel of death would sweep through Scores of young people, children, young boys, teenagers. If there was a firstborn, they are now dead. Can you imagine? I watched a documentary just a couple of days ago 
Since there's no sports on television right now, I'm trying to get my fix by watching old reruns of games and documentaries, sports documentaries. And there was one documentary in, about a young man by the name of Lynn Bias who was projected, he was the number two pick of the draft, I believe 1986, selected by the Boston Celtics. One of the greatest college basketball players of that era. After his draft, he was elated as one could imagine, but his mom, I heard her say that even though that I was excited for my boy, there was something in me that was uneasy. Uneasy. One night, I heard his father say that as he was out with his friends, that his father was, he said, I couldn't sleep. But all of a sudden, something on the inside of me said, get up and pray for Lynn. It was his son. Pray for him. He said, I didn't really know what to do. He said, this premonition that I had just to pray, he said, I stayed up all night. He never said if he did or not. I hope he did. But needless to say, a couple of days later, as Lynn would arrive back home to visit his mom and dad, he would visit with them for a moment and leave to go back to the University of Maryland where he played his college basketball. And he got together with, I believe, a teammate, a friend who, for the majority of that night, began to snort cocaine, drink alcohol. And it was said that this cocaine that they were snorting was 98% pure. And as he was snort, he would snort, drink for a little bit, snort some more, drink a little bit more. People would come in and out, and no one knew the wiser until the friend said that I saw him lay back on his bed and all of a sudden begin to convulse with a seizure. He called the ambulance, and they got there. They brought him to the hospital. The scene was chaotic. Players, teammates, friends, students, all were in that vicinity. His mom said that he walked in and she looked at the nurse and said, He's gone. She said, No, he's still breathing. And she asked the nurse, but is he breathing on his own? She said, we're breathing for him. A ventilator. Breathing for him. And after a period of what seemed like forever, as time would stand still for them, ultimately, this upstart young basketball player could have been one of the greatest of all time. Quit breathing. They showed a picture of his father who was devastated. And he made this statement. We've heard it said before, but this time it stuck with me just a little bit and it hit close to home. As he would say that it's not right for a parent to bury their child. It's not right for a parent to bury that child. And I can't imagine what they were going through. And yet, all over Egypt, the cries of the parents would ring forth as they would hold their firstborn son. All throughout Egypt, death had filled the land. And it reached to the very palace of Egypt. As Pharaoh kneeling down and holding his son called and sent for Moses. And as Moses would walk into the palace on this seventh time, Pharaoh looked at him and said, get out. Leave. 
All the people of Egypt were saying, leave, get out. Take all, take all of our wealth. Take all of our clothes. Take everything. Just leave. And here's the people of God who had known slavery for generation after generation. They walked out of Egypt happy, healthy, with all the wealth of Egypt. Something they had never experienced before. Shouting the praises of God. Worshiping God. But God was about to lead them into an impossible situation. I want you to think about that for a moment. God was about to lead them, even though they were shouting and worshiping and praising, God was about to lead them into an impossible situation. I want you to think about this for a moment. Just to apply what we have just mentioned to our lives right now. Could it be that as that death angel came through that city and the blood that was on the doorpost guaranteed the safety of those and the deliverance of those who were the people of God and even others who obeyed the word of Moses? Could it be that, let me say it this way, the means by which Satan holds mankind in captivity is sin. The very thing that holds mankind in slavery is sin. I think of it this way, that as that death angel came and there were scores of, it was death all over the place, but it took death to set that person free. The death of an innocent animal, but also the death of those in Egypt. Could it be that in the mind of God, whenever you said yes to Jesus Christ, that your old man died? And when your old man died because there was a death, Satan can no longer hold you in captivity. Because of a death, Satan can no longer hold you in bondage. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, which has been applied to the doorpost of your heart, that is your means of deliverance. That is your means of salvation. That is your means of praise. That is your means of worship. The blood on the doorpost. When I see the blood... I will pass over you. Thank God it's still the same today. It's not when I see your works, but it's when I see the blood. I will pass over you. Go back to Egypt. Maybe a few days have passed and the people of God are marching, worshiping and praising God, not knowing what was before them. And, he, and Pharaoh emerges finally from his palace. And he begins to overlook the city of Egypt. It is in complete destruction. Crops are gone. They're wheeling out the dead. Homes are destroyed. He surveys the damage. And maybe he had advisors with him, and he said to his advisors, We must rebuild. This is the mightiest nation on the planet. We must rebuild. And an advisor asks permission to speak. Pharaoh granted. Maybe he just looked and asked him, Pharaoh, how? How are we going to rebuild? There's very little cattle to haul equipment and what is needed to rebuild. Many of our people are dead. And you cannot get our people to rebuild the city. And the slaves that did build the city, you just let them go. You let them go. They're gone. 
They're no longer here. We, we gave them all of the money. We gave them everything. We have nothing to rebuild. And it was at that moment that Pharaoh's heart grew hardened. Realizing what he had just done. And he turned to his advisors and said, Mount the steeds, get the horsemen, those that are here and alive and ready and able, and we are going after them. Child of God, listen to me. When you get saved, it's all praise and glory. It is. Your whole world is changed. It's like you step outside and the sky is more blue than what you've ever known before. There's, some, there's a change that has taken place in your heart and in your life. There's something that has taken place that you cannot explain. But it's at the same time, God is blessing you and blessing you and blessing you. But don't think for one moment that Satan is going to say, Well, I've lost. They're gone. I've got to go back and find something else. No. He's going to come after you with everything he's got. He lost you, but now he's going to come after you to try to get back what he had lost. And this time he's going to come with the, all the, 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 the armies of hell as they're coming after the people of God. Going back to the children of Israel. They're worshiping, they're praising. When all of a sudden, in the distance, they come to an impasse. There is a Red Sea that is in front of them. They cannot cross it because it's too deep. Many of them, they don't know how to swim, they drown. They cannot traverse around because there are monolithic mountains on either side staring down at them. And they turn back and they see behind them the cloud of dust. They know Pharaoh's army is just a little bit away. And their praise, their worship, turns to grumbling and complaining. Even to the point of telling Moses, why did you bring us here? We were better off in Egypt. They were ready to stone him and kill him, and yet they had forgotten what God had just done for them. Many times when we face, they were in an impossible situation. What are they going to do? They can't go through the Red Sea. They can't go around the Red Sea. All they see in their mind is either death in front of them or slavery behind them. Some of you, that's where you are. You're in an impossible situation. You don't see any way out. You are hemmed in by the powers of darkness. They are surrounding you. And there is that thing called fear that grips your heart. But at that moment as they begin to complain, the Spirit of God begins to move upon Moses. And Moses quiets the people. And he tells the people, some 2.2 to 3 million people, he gives them something that we can utilize today. The first thing he tells them was, fear not. You think about that, fear not. Their fear had gripped their hearts and gripped their souls to the point where panic was setting in. And yet Moses says, fear not. Fear is something that every single one of us is going to face at some point in our life. Fear is something that every one of us, whether it is something of our own making or something that is completely out of our control. And if there are things that are completely out of our control, there's something that we 
didn't do it. There's something that we don't know what else to do. Fear begins to set in, which leads to panic, which leads to anxiety, which leads to depression and oppression. We're facing that at this present time right now, right now at unprecedented times. Fear and panic has rattled this nation. Fear and panic, anxiety is trapping this nation. But to the child of God, the Holy Spirit is saying, fear ye not. Don't fear. Why? How are you telling us not to fear? The world is in chaos. Why are you telling us not to fear? I'll say it this way. The only way I know how to say it, and it's in the words of a song written by Bill Gaither, many things about tomorrow I may not need to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. I know who holds my hand. I may not see the future. I may not understand what's right in front of me, but I know in whom I have believed, and I know God is going to get us through. You need to know this. If God brought you out, he is going to bring you through. If God brought, I feel that. If God brought you out, he will see you through. He'll bring you through. Glory to God. He will bring you through. He won't leave you in a desert place. He won't leave you to rot and die, but he will bring you through. Glory to God. That's the kind of God that we serve. He's there when we need him. You can stand on his word. That's the kind of God that I serve. Glory to God. Don't forget what God has already done for you. Don't look, when you look back at your life as, you, as you're facing the unknown and you're facing with that which, which you cannot understand or even explain, whenever fear begins to knock at the door of your heart, let your faith answer. Let your faith answer. When fear knocks on the door of your heart, let your faith answer. Faith and fear are complete opposites. Fear says, I don't know if God can. Fear says, I'm not sure if God is able. Faith says, no matter what the circumstance it is, I know God is able. No matter what the situation may be, I know God is able. I know there may be sickness and death and destruction, but I know that God is able. There may be panic, but I know God is able. I know, listen, listen nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing. This situation in Egypt where they were led to the Red Sea, God allowed them to go there. Maybe he even led them there. And we have to look at it right now, presently. This did not take God by surprise. Maybe he even allowed this to happen. He might have allowed this to take place. Why? Why? In his infinite wisdom, only he knows. But I will say this, and you have to forgive my personal bias here, but I honestly believe God knows everything. There's nothing that takes him by surprise. And in this situation, there was a reason why God has birthed this network. Because of times just like this. When all the churches are can't meet because they don't have the technological advances that many churches may have and churches are shut down. They're not able to get to church. They can turn on the television set. They can go online. They can turn on the radio and they can hear, thus saith the Lord. They can hear the gospel going out all over this world. In times like this, he's saying, fear not. There's a reason that that term fear not and other words like it are found over 300 times in Scripture. There's a reason why the Holy Spirit allowed it to be put in Scripture that many times. I heard, I heard Dad and Papa and Lauren and, and, and all the others say this at times in their ministry. They said if, if God tells you one thing, if he says it once, listen. But if he says it twice, you need to pay attention. 
But if he mentions it over 300 times, he's trying to tell us something. He's trying to tell us something. That if the, listen, listen, the message is clear. You need not fear. My, that, that sound, man, I, I think I just entered, now you have to forgive me, this is level to hear, but I think I just channeled my inner Muhammad Ali and started rhyming all this stuff. The message is clear. You shall not fear. No need to fear. Why? Because God has got everything under control. He's still on the throne. He is still seated by the right hand of the Father. He's still pouring out his spirit. And I believe that when we come through this, that we will be better than what we were before we came into this situation. He said, fear not. The second thing he tells them is, stand still. Now that is against human nature. When there is a situation at hand, and there's panic that sets in, Everything in you wants to do something to try to correct it, to fix it, to handle it. And Moses saying, you don't have to worry. Stand still. That means don't move a muscle. In the spiritual connotation for right now he's telling us quit trying to rely on our own strength when there is a problem in our life there is a situation there is something that is uh controlling us even as a child of god we want to try to correct that problem and fix that problem but many times we don't know how as moses instructed by the Holy Spirit, tells the people of God to stand still. Paul in the New Testament, my favorite verse of all time, Galatians 5.1, says the same thing. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. Stand fast. The psalmist said, be like a tree that is planted by the waters. No matter what comes your way, no matter what happens, stand your ground. Stand still. Don't walk away from the message. Don't walk away from Christ and him crucified. Keep your faith planted. He was saying, stand still. Look what God has done for you through, through the shed blood of the Lamb. Paul was saying, look at what God has already accomplished through Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. That's what we are to rely upon at this very time. Thank God for medicine. Thank God for the scientists that are working. Thank God for all of that. But as a child of God, don't worry, don't fear, and stand still. Quit relying upon our own strengths and abilities. And then he said, see the salvation of the Lord. In other words, you're about ready to see something that God's never done before. And he's going he's to rock your world by doing this. I'm here to tell you right now, there may be a, pre a present situation that you are facing. And the Holy Spirit is telling you, watch me go to work. When you try to handle it and when you get your hands in it, you mess everything up royally. But the Holy Spirit is saying, let me do the work for you. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Watch him. Watch him do a work. Watch him bring about victory. Watch him bring about healing. Watch him bring about deliverance. Watch him do a tremendous work in your life. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. Then he says this, the Egyptians that you see, you shall see them no more forever. What that means is this, all they had known of the Egyptians during that time was an ominous, evil taskmaster lording over them, enslave, enslaving his people. And God is telling them, that type of Egypt you're not going to see at all anymore. That problem in your life that has risen its ugly head and you don't really know what to do whenever you don't fear, whenever you stand still, place your faith in what Christ has accomplished for you at Calvary and you see the salvation of the Lord. That problem that has been ominous, that has been hurtful, that has been overbearing, you shall not see it in that capacity any longer. Hallelujah. 
You won't see it. That means that nicotine, you won't see it. The immorality, you won't see it in that fashion any longer. You won't see it. And allow me to say this. I may be speaking presumptuously, but I am speaking right now by faith. This problem that this nation is seeing, we're not going to see it any longer. I believe God's going to do something. He's going to, I'm just praying that he's going to wipe the whole thing out, that he's going to wipe everything out in regards to this flu, this, 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 this virus, and that we won't see it any longer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what we're praying for, not only in this nation but around the world. In other words, I want to say it one more time. When fear knocks on the door of your heart, don't let fear answer, but let your faith arise and let your faith answer and watch God begin to go to work. Then he said, God will fight for you. And Paul said it best. Since God is for you, who in the world can be against you. If God is for you, and since God is for you, who can be against you? As Elisha's servant, as he looked up into the mountains and he saw that Syrian army that had surrounded them, and fear had gripped his heart, it was Elisha that said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see that there is more for us than is against us. And right now, there is more for you than against you. Because one with God is a majority. And if Satan wants to get to you, he's got to go through God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and all of the angelic hosts. And that means he won't let him get to you without a fight. There will be more for you than against you. God is going to fight for you. Singers and musicians, go ahead and come on back. Then he says this, this last thing. As the people of God are trying to wrap their heads around what the prophet is saying. Moses, you're telling us to fear not. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. The Egyptians that we have seen in this light, we're not going to see any longer. And you said God's going to fight for us. How? We're hemmed in. There's nowhere to go. And all of a sudden, Moses spoke to that crowd of people. And he said two words that are some of the most important words found in Scripture. Go forward. Go forward. You see, there's no backwards with God. There's no going back to Egypt with God. There's no going back to the desert with God. There's only one direction, and that is go forward. Hey, you got to think about this. Go forward? What what, what are you going to do? What is God going to do? There's a Red Sea in front of, there's mountains on either side, and Pharaoh now is getting closer than ever. And you're saying, go forward? In other words, I believe that Moses turned and told those people, God said he's going to turn it around. God said he's going to turn it around. What the devil meant for evil, God is going to make it good. Turn around, turn around, turn around. And he struck forth that rod. And as he struck forth that rod, it was as if two giant hands came down, invisible hands came down from the sky and began to push those waters back. And let me tell you something. You want to talk about a miracle? Just imagine being there. Just imagine seeing it with your own eyes. I've seen the pictures. We've seen the descriptions over television of what it could have happened. But just to see it live and as to see those walls of water begin to go up on either side and there was dry ground, dry dirt beneath their feet. My Lord, you want to talk about a miracle of unprecedented proportions. We are about ready to see the Red Sea's part right now. I believe that we're about ready to see these Red Seas parting right now. That way God's people can walk through on dry ground. And when the last 
Israelite. When that last Hebrew child walked across that Red Sea as Moses stood out and he saw Pharaoh's army as they were getting closer and closer and closer. The very moment they hit the middle of that Red Sea, Moses struck out that rod and those hands removed themselves and those waters came crashing down around them where they experienced victory like they've never known before. I'm here to tell you right now, God said he's going to turn it around. Whatever situation you're facing, I believe it. God said he's going to turn it around. What the devil meant for evil, God is going to turn it around for your good. You just have to believe it. You have to believe it. Stand still. Fear not. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. I'm going to have them sing that chorus. God said he turned it around. And I want you watching me and listening. No matter where you may be around the world, start believing right now that God is still, he's still a way maker. He's still still going to turn it around. Just sing it one more time. God said he Come on now, I want you to sing it with them. I want you to believe God with them right now. come before you this morning in the name of Jesus. Yes, we declare it yes. that you're going to turn this situation around. That what the devil meant for evil, God is going to turn it around for our good. Yes. We declare blessings on your people and we thank you for what you're going to do here within our hearts and in our lives. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Be with us once again by television tonight by internet tonight, 6 o'clock. Don't miss it. One more time. God said he would turn.